Proton beam therapy is a form of radiation therapy. It has the same biological effects as x-rays or photons that are used in 99% of radiation oncology departments worldwide. The difference is in the physics of protons. Protons go into the tissue, into the body, they get to a certain depth, and they stop. So there's never an exit dose. And if you can imagine treating somebody with many fields of radiation, and you never have an exit dose, then you can treat tumors that are close to critical structures. You can treat children and growing adolescents and avoid important normal structures that can affect function, cosmesis, uh, the probability of cancers forming 20, 30 years later from radiation. So for certain patients, it's a substantial advantage versus x-ray therapy. Exit dose is a radiation dose that goes past the tumor. So if the tumor's here and a beam of radiation is here, protons hit the tumor and stop at the end of my hand. With x-rays, would also hit the tumor equally as well, but they would continue out through the normal parts of the body. Well, the exit dose is usually associated with uh, acute side effects, uh, side effects that occur within the first year of treatment, as well as very late effects that occur 20, 30 years after treatment in tumors that require a very high dose of radiation that you can't give with x-rays because of side effects to the surrounding normal structures. And if you think about advances in surgery, advances in uh, targeted therapies, radiation will still be a very large component of the treatment of those patients. But if you can have a more precise treatment, obviously that offers a great deal to our patients. Um, you know, for example, a patient with an eye tumor, um, you know, before protons or without protons, there, um, you know, would obviously be a dose um, delivered to the, to the eye and to the tumor, but then also through the rest of the brain. And so, um, particularly for young developing children, but even for adults in that case, um, to have radiation um, dose in healthy tissue in the brain really can affect um, you know, cognitive and, and neuro abilities down the road. So with protons, the dose, you know, is delivered to the tumor um, and then, as Jay said, stops. Um, so you, you, you're able to spare much more of the, of the healthy brain tissue that way. at who's involved, physicians and nurses. Well, that's the same as with x-ray therapy, but there are proton medical physicists. There are proton medical dosimetrists, the people that plan the radiation. There are mechanical engineers. There are cyclotron engineers that are on site 24 hours a day, so the facility stays operational. So the uh, manpower is significant. The expertise of people involved is significant. So uh, it is a, a very uh, complicated system, not to the patient. For the patient, it's very similar as if they were going for x-ray therapy, but what's behind it all is so much more complicated. When you talk about the physical space, I mean, our current proton center is about a football field long and, th and the equivalent of three stories high. I mean, it takes an incredible amount of real estate, um, you know, moving forward, they've certainly done a good job about trying to make um, the proton delivery devices smaller. They still have a ways to go to really make them as, as small as they need to be, but they've certainly um, made them more compact. But um, so it, it, it does take up a lot of space, and, and to Jay's point, it takes a tremendous amount of expertise. And, and he didn't even, he talked about the the behind the scenes in terms of the physicists and the engineers, but then, um, you know, our, our frontline um, radiation therapists who are in the room um, treating patients are also, um, you know, highly skilled in taking care of patients using protons, and that is a different skill set than those who've been um, trained using a typical linear accelerator. You have to have therapists specifically trained for protons. You have to have medical physicists 
You have to have mechanical engineers. You have to have planners. You have to have, as you brought up, shop uh, experts who can mold uh, the collimators and compensators you need for the patient's treatment. So it does require a substantial investment in uh, people and equipment. I will say, though, um, you know, there have been a relatively few number of proton centers over the last 10 years, partly because it was still a relatively early um, technology, but we're certainly seeing um, within the last couple of years and looking prospectively forward that there are going to be more proton centers opening up across the country for, for certain. Do you see a and I, I will add, that's positive, not negative. Okay, that's what I was right. Some people yeah. say, well, yeah. you know, you've created so much competition that you won't lead the world in proton therapy. And I'd argue if proton therapy is that much better than x-rays, then we want other institutions that have proton centers. It allows us to do clinical research with other institutions. It also makes, makes a major statement that the MGH initial investment in protons was the right decision. Uh, most children nowadays are treated using protons, um, and it's because of because of the leadership MGH played in in terms of um, you know investing in protons. For instance, when I when I was a resident, we never treated tumors of the liver because you'd be concerned you'd destroy the normal function of the liver. But now we can do that because of the precision and accuracy of proton therapy. Same with certain types of lung tumors. Uh, certain tumors around the spine. And as Andrea brought up in the beginning, there's an interesting tumor, uh, a primary melanoma of the retina. And if you treated it to the dose it requires to cure it, you'd be sending all the dose through the normal eye all the way through the rest of the brain and, and out the back of the head. So there are curable tumors today with radiation that when I was young required rather mutilating surgery to obtain uh, high cure rates. There's also the outcome in terms of reduced complications, and, um, and, th and that we're also doing studies on in terms of, um, you know, and quality of life studies, and Jay could probably elaborate on that as well. Eighty percent of solid tumors of childhood are cured with chemotherapy and radiation, but at a substantial cost in the long term as uh, concerned with side effects. And if you can reduce the side effects, you actually reduce the cost of taking care of that person for the next 70 or 80 years of projected survival. So while the initial costs with protons might be somewhat more than with x-rays, the ultimate cost of that person's health care is reduced. budget and it has to in the United States or we would ruin our economy and we owe it to this country and we owe it to the world in fact to show that nobody would question that protons give a better dose distribution but how does that translate into clinical outcomes? Is it a 5% gain? Is it a 50% gain in reduction of side effects? Is it a 10%, 20 30% improvement and survival. So as an academic institution, our physicians and other healthcare providers in our department are dedicated to studying the issues of proton therapy and to providing that information in the world's medical literature. Yeah, and one of the things that, um, that the payers do appreciate is that MGH, um, our radiation oncologists are very judicious and thoughtful about when they use protons. And, and they can see that you know there are certain cases where it, there really isn't a difference between using um, conventional radiation therapy or IMRT and protons. And in those cases, our um, physicians use the the the, the cheaper um, option um, because there there is no benefit to using protons. Um, so that, that you know they do appreciate that there is an an expertise and a wisdom and and judgment that goes into making those decisions and that we're not um, just using protons because we, we have it. 
we've had a, a, a very uh, positive uh, relationship with a major insurance company in the Commonwealth. Uh, they don't have anything to do with design of trials, but if trials are being done, they want to know why. If trials are done and we have results, they want to know the results, as do we as, as the, the medical community at large. Uh, and it, clearly, the, the uh, U.S. government, Medicare, is very interested in the results. And this gets into the controversy of protons. You know, if you have an 80-year-old man with prostate cancer who needs treatment, I'll emphasize that, who needs treatment, and you can show that the distribution of radiation dose is better with protons than x-rays, and they come back and say, well, his projected survival is without cancer is only three or four years. Well, I think most people would say it isn't worth the added expense of proton therapy. But in that example, we are doing a randomized trial comparing protons to x-rays. Uh, it was a bold move by the department, and I am very proud of members in our department that designed the trial, that recruited the University of Pennsylvania, one of the great medical centers in this country, to join us in this trial. And now we have four other centers that have committed to do it, so we can do it on time. And we can show that the results aren't specific for the MGH, but they're applicable to proton centers in general. We, we do limit the number of patients with prostate cancer that we treat on, on, you know, here at MGH. So to Jay's point, all the more reason that we need to have collaborators when we do studies um, so that we can, you know, have the ability to accrue patients more quickly. The prostate trial, as an example, has healthcare policy people involved in the design. It has ethicists involved because what if a patient refuses to be randomized to x-rays and our point is we won't treat you, at least you have a 50% chance if you enter the trial being randomized to protons, but if you don't enter the trial, we will not offer you protons. Well, for-profit proton centers will treat most people who have prostate cancer if they walk in the door. So. You're exactly right. It brings in a whole group of people in the healthcare field that we've never worked with before. And in the rationing issue, uh, we have a limited number of spots we can treat children. What do you do for a child in Dorchester that has a brain tumor that protons would clearly benefit and we don't have room? Or we have two such children and only one slot. What is our responsibility? Do we say, I'm just sorry, you have to go to a children's hospital and get x-ray therapy? Do we facilitate them going to another proton center? Or don't we even bring up the subject? It's very complicated. And th those are the ethical challenges that our radiation oncology physicians face almost every day. And, and it is particularly um, tough on the pediatric radiation oncologists because, um, you know, they know that there's such an advantage for children. So the uh, expansion project um, it was a dream of uh, many people for many years. And it's not just purely expansion as defined by treating more patients, but it's, it's having a duplicate proton availability for the institution. We're treating 60 to 75 patients a day. What if the cyclotron, the machine that makes protons, has a big hiccup one day and it goes down? And what if it goes down, we think for a day, it's two days, it's three days. The more you delay somebody's radiation treatment, it decays the cure rates for these patients. So talking about ethical issues, mm -hmm. what do you do? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really very, very important for patient safety and the quality of care to know that if we have two machines, the probability of both machines going down would be very small and that we'd always be able to offer patients treatment. We have a space carved out in the Lunder Building, which is the equivalent about, of about the size of two um, linear accelerator vaults. 
And so right now it's just a big um, concrete empty space, um, but we've made the business plan, um, you know, in the, in the case of the hospital, and as Jay said, they um, are 100% supportive of it. They've given us the green light in terms of um, funding and resources to make it happen. So we then applied um, to the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health for a determination of need, which we need anytime we're going to add um, a new treatment device, and that was approved a few months ago. And so um, right now we're going through the process of evaluating um, vendors for the equipment, and we actually plan to have a decision on that within the next few days. But we expect by 2015 that we should be treating our first patients in that, uh, with that new proton device in the Lunder Building. And it will, be, um, it will be actually nice for the first time to have protons and photons um, next to each other adjacent in the same space. Um, and there are some patients who, over the course of their treatment, get both protons and photons. Um, and, and there will be some advantages to having them co-located. You know, every Tuesday morning our physicians have um, proton rounds where they review the list of patients who are um, seeking treatment at the proton center and, and essentially every week they're having to make the tough decisions on who's going to get one of the um, slots and, and how um, often it's how soon they can get a slot and for some patients the wait is, is too long. You know, they need to start treatment before they can get a slot, and so they, you know, they aren't able to, to come here. And it's also challenging in that many of our protocols require um, patients to start within a certain time frame in order to, to qualify for that clinical trial. So, um, you know, th those are part, part of the trade-offs that happen at that weekly proton rounds. allows us to attract the best resident applicants in the world, which we do. Uh, we're the most competitive program clearly in the United States. Uh, it's, it's hard to get into our training program as it is to get into Harvard Medical School or Harvard Law School, if not harder. Uh, these young folks that we train, those are our future faculty members. Those are our future leaders. Those are our drivers of innovative clinical trials, and it's, it's growth and investigation outside of protons, too. We have a very large biology program. Uh, we have the largest, actually, federally funded basic biology program in cancer than any other radiation oncology department in this country. And we have some young, brilliant faculty members who are interested in basic science and some are interested in clinical and translational research. But I think protons are one of many things our department offers to allow us to attract the best and brightest and to retain them. So when other institutions are growing, they, they, uh, uh, we are in a good competitive environment to keep those uh, young folks with us. Clearly, uh, having two proton centers will allow us to, in many cases, abbreviate the treatment so people don't have to come in five days a week for eight weeks. The treatment is so focused, we can perhaps do it in three days or four days or five days. We're investigating that. We also have a tremendous interest in combining precision radiation oncology, i.e. protons, with the new targeted therapies in medical oncology. Certain diseases, radiation has never played a major role because there was no systemic therapy for, such as melanoma. But now that there are improvements in the treatment, of historically resistant tumors, radiation is now becoming an active player in the treatment of many different diseases than ever before. But if you look at, you know, computers, the way they used to take up, um, you know, a football field long and now you can carry them around in your hand, um, I, I think we're going to see the same thing with, with protons and that it's going to become um, easier and cheaper to deliver and, and it's going to have to be. Um, in order for society to continue to um, take advantage of it. Well, you know, it's funny, you know, I give tours of the Proton Center, I would say probably once a week because it is a real um, showpiece for the MGH. 
And um, at the end of the tour, I, I always highlight um, the bell that we have hanging on the wall that patients at the end of their six weeks of treatment, you know, Monday through Friday, every day, ring in celebration of the fact that they've finally completed their treatment and their family and their therapists and nurses and their physician all gather around to celebrate with them. And often when people write me thank you notes or say, remember when I came in, you know, toward the Proton Center, the part that they remember actually or that they cite is that bell ringing. So even visitors, I think, appreciate that um, despite the, the, the facility and the fancy technology, that in the end it really is about taking care of patients um, and that we really have a remarkable patient experience here at MDH.